just when I thought I was being relieved of correcting Martin Zender's errors, I came out with a doozy this morning. One that I refuse to ignore. I heed Martin and his followers' warning. This is Martin's explanation on what it means to be in subjection of authority, according to Romans 13. If you want to press your rights, if you want to give me intricate, highfalutin arguments about why you are a sovereign, why the government has no right of any power over you, you're missing the entire point. Somebody made a great comment two days ago saying that, you know, Clyde Pilkington and this Dwayne Galantine guy, they're turning Paul back into Saul, the persecutor. I love that. That's right. We have Paul who became a peaceful person, a lover of peace. And now we're supposed to believe that Paul is the one wielding the sword in Romans 13, and he's the one persecuting people. Telling people to fear him because he is this great authority and that he will wreak vengeance. And then it is insisted to me that um, <clears throat> we are to be the arbiters of what is the good and evil of the context of Romans 13. In Romans 13, 4 says, do good, and you will be having applause from it. That is from the superior authority. For it is God's servant for your good. I'm going to get into that God's servant thing, because that's what's throwing off Galentine. For it is your servant, it is your, it is God's servant for your good. Now, if you should be doing evil, fear, for not fainly is the authority wearing the sword. People say to me, okay, Martin, well, if the authority is doing good, then we're to be subject to it. But if the authority in our esteemed estimation becomes evil, then we have no right to be subject to that authority. In this case, you are doing the exact thing Paul tells you not to do back in Romans 12, which is do not come to pass for prudent with yourselves. Don't come to pass as being the ultimate judge of what is good and evil. Because in fact, this is so simple. The good and evil of this context does not depend on a subjective opinion of when a government passes from good into evil. The good of this passage is subjection. That's the context. The evil of this, passion, of this passage is being insubordinate to the superior authorities. Those are the good and evil. That's the context. This is not up for a vote. It's not up for an opinion. I'm a stickler for context, and that's what a lot of people are missing here. We decide what's good and what's evil. No, the context decides. And in the context, the good of the context is subjection. The evil is insubordination. Go ahead. Fight for your rights. Go ahead. Good job. You've <clears throat> taken away your own peace. You've landed your ass in jail. You've stuck your ass with thousands of dollars of legal fees defending your rights. To what result? You end up doing exactly what Paul told you not to do, you forfeit a mild and quiet life, all for the self-satisfaction of having beat the system. Good job, not. I'd like to address two things within his context. One, God uses authority over us for our good. I agree with that. Secondly, my main concern of this whole video is when he says Paul leads a quiet life and teaches us to, much like him, lead a quiet life. We'll get to that in a bit. But first, I'd like to explain God using and subjecting us to authority for our good. Why? Because he foreknew that one of us, if not all of us, would say this. Should we sin so grace may abound? Should we sin so grace may abound? God forbid. Let it not be. Ugh. Good thing I had the forethought 
to build an authoritative system over mankind whom I made in my image a free will agent. This authoritative system is to subject them to my moral law due to the desires of the flesh. Paul is actually emphasizing that we do not have the authority to now go out and steal somebody's property and say to the authority, well, I've got liberty in Christ. No, God placed an authority over us for consequences to our willful flesh. So when the authorities come knocking on your door because you have become some sort of criminal because of the freedom that you have in Christ, that we are to be subjective. So when they say, um, you're under arrest, submit. What? what? Oh, the taxes. This is speaking of taxes. Oh, by the way, I'm going to go back to Galantine's article. But when Paul says in verse 6, for therefore you are settling taxes also, for they are God's minister perpetuated for this self same thing. <laughs> this God's minister's thing is really intense. So the same thing that I told you about why he put the system of authority over us is the same reason we have taxes for our good. Even though you might not see it, he does. I sure hope that someday Martin hears himself say that God uses evil to discipline his people. This is mature truth. This is mature truth that even Nero became a servant of God. That's mature truth. So if you want to ignore that and put yourself in the place of a judge, put yourself in the place of one who decides what's good or evil. God's moral law decides what's good or evil. Put yourself in the place of being prudent. Then you will be the one who decides who is God's minister and who is not. And you will be predisposed to not being able to read this passage for what it says, which is the government is God's servant. Oh, along that line, got to, got to read A. E. Knock here. When you hear this comment, now, you, I'm going to go back to the awful commentary from Dwayne Gallantine of the Grace Brethren Church in Centuria, Wisconsin. Let us all pray for Centuria, Wisconsin. This is a good commentary on this passage. A. Enoch nails it here in the concordant commentary. I quote. A. Enoch, Martin's idol. With verse 1 of Romans chapter 13, unlike Israel. We do not come into conflict with the rulers of the world. The setting up of the kingdom will involve the subjection of them all to the suzerainty of Christ, but we have no place in that earthly kingdom. While Israel is thrust aside, we must recognize the existing authorities. Here's the shocker, folks, and I quote, God is not at variance with present governments. God is not at variance with present governments. Did you see that passion of Martin come alive when he quoted his idol, A. Enoch? He sure does have a zeal. What Martin is gathering is that we must recognize authority as in just no matter what they say, submit to it. You know, this present government that is currently setting up the system for the world to receive the mark of the beast. That is the truth of Romans 13 that so many people gag on and choke on because they are prudent 
in their own eyes and in their own estimations. This is what I always tell people. You say, Paul says in Romans 13, 1, to be subject to authorities. But here's Peter in Acts chapter 3, 4, 5, whatever it is, telling us that he should obey God and not man. Here's the simple answer to that. Romans 13, 1 hadn't been written yet. <laughs> Romans 13, 1 doesn't apply in Acts chapter 4 because it hadn't been written yet. Yeah, see, I make sense for a living. This is why you come here. Yes, it does apply to both because they're both pertaining to God's moral law. And he makes sense for a living. Back to A.B. Nock, I quote, our conflict is with the sovereignties and the authorities and the world knights and the spiritual forces of wickedness among the celestial. We are to be sandaled with the evangel peace. The evangel peace. A. E. Nock, quote, we are to be sandaled with the evangel of peace. Martin's interpretation of his idol is that that means that we are to be peaceful, quiet people. You know, like Paul. No, it means we are not fighting against people in government. We are fighting against the spirits that they welcomed into their vessels to gain power over the earth. Peaceful Paul says, put on the whole armor of God to fight against them. Ephesians 6, start, starting in verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that we may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet showed with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Does that sound to you like lead a quiet life? No, it sounds like prepare for battle against those who have willingly welcomed another spirit, which is of the Antichrist. And we're told that if we have not the spirit of God, we are none of his. Back to Nock, I quote, the true believer should make the most exemplary citizen for he has a deeper motive and a more powerful impulse to obedience than the unbeliever. He recognizes the civil authorities as God's servants. That's the point I was making earlier. They are God's servants. This is shocking truth to babies. They don't want to hear that the evil authorities are God's servants. They want to rebel. But what did God, because rebellion is in the human heart, what did God tell Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and all the house of Judah that went into captivity into Babylon. He said, this thing is of me. What did he say when the kingdom of Israel broke up after the days of Solomon and the northern tribes, the house of Israel went to Samaria and the southern tribes, the house of Judah stayed in, in Jerusalem. He said, this thing is of me. So Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, they get the word from God. This thing is of me, even though it's completely illicit. It's completely illegal. Is it legal for Nebuchadnezzar to march an army into Jerusalem and to take the sacred things of the temple to plunder God's temple? What worse thing could you possibly do than to march into the Holy of Holies to take the candlestick, to take the Ark of the freaking Covenant? Is that legal? Is that nice? 
Don't you have a right, Israel, to maintain your own vessels of worship? Ah, but God said, this thing is of me. And he said, go to Babylon, because I'm telling you, if you resist Babylon, you will die. This is what Paul was saying in Romans 13. If you resist Rome, you will die. This is what I'm telling you in 2019. If you resist the civil authorities, you will die. Either you will literally die or you will die of worry. And by fretting whether or not the government's going to find you out. You want that kind of a life? Go for it. God is warning you against it. God is warning you not to accept the spirit of the Antichrist. 2 Thessalonians 2, starting in verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he is taken out of the way. We know who that is, the Holy Spirit. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Heed the warning. God is using this wicked government to punish. Anybody who's insisting on their rights to fight the man, you're returning evil for evil. Don't you see that? You're fighting evil with evil. And you're promoting it and you're criticizing me for promoting peace and for, for promoting subjection to the superior authorities, for understanding what Paul is saying here. What Martin is promoting is subjection to the superior authority. That's what he's promoting. Just what Satan has in mind as he is setting up his government for the world to submit to him and receive his mark of the beast. Submit to him all of your rights to bear arms or to buy and sell. Submit to him all of your rights. That is, if you want and desire all the luxuries that this world has to offer, submit your firearms and receive the mark of the beast so that you are able to buy and sell worldly goods. You're pissed about the way the government tells you to live? Well, vengeance is God's. He's going to wreck the government. Does that make you happy? It should. Okay. I'm going to make you happy here. God is going to wreck the government that you hate. Okay? God's going to do it. Vengeance is his, not yours. In the meantime, you subject to it. God will take care of it. In the meantime, you subject to it. God will take care of it. Said Martin Zender, who claims to be making sense for a living. Titus 1.11, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not, for filthy lucre's sake. And the religious authorities are a complete wreck, and they are actually less esteemed in the eyes of God, then the civil authorities. Put that in your tax envelope and pay it. The end. Yes, Martin, the religious are a part of the whole plan of the mark of the beast. They're all in the process of uniting and becoming one world order when the man of sin is revealed. 2 Thessalonians 2 chapter 4 Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself 
that he is God. Martin is helping Satan set up his kingdom by, I quote, promoting subjection to the superior authorities. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. Martin Zender and those who idolize him, I love you. I hope you're blessed.